I apologize for the delay in getting this posted. Uh, I tried it with uh, one way and unfortunately uh, that got lost in the cloud someplace. I'm not sure where it went. So I'm going back to screencast using it. I'll probably just stay with screencast from now on rather than trying the other technique. Uh, this past week, of course, um, we should have been talking about um, the movement away from Huck Finn into uh, a different work, including uh, Henry James here, uh, as well as uh, a couple other, Bret Hart. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and focus on Henry James uh, for right now, because um, this work, Daisy Miller, that you were asked to read is a little longer. Um, Henry James was one of those uh, authors who can be a little polarizing. When he was um, at his height in the late uh, 1800s, early uh, 20th century, uh, James was regarded as the best novelist. Uh, I mean, really was in, in American literature. He was he was upheld and considered, uh, you know, really, really, uh, as it says here, one of America's greatest novelists and uh, also critic. Um, but uh, uh, one of the key aspects about it, his work has faded a little bit uh, in uh, popularity um, critically uh, over the years, but uh, really, um, uh, James uh, uh, is uh, highly accomplished in what he does. What's really interesting is that many of his major works, uh, uh, written in a, a period uh, when you have um, society focused upon uh, changes and development. Again, he's writing more, as you'll see, he's born in 43, 1843, so he's living through the, the Civil War. Um, he's seen the changes uh, politically. He has seen other aspects that change the country, uh, development of industrial uh, cities and factories and inventions, etc. Um, what you wind up with is as a writer who instead focuses more on subtleties. Um, those changes don't really come into play with his writing. Um, rather, he looks at the movement of America just as Twain is seeing an, a, a changing America, and he uses the pre-Civil War to highlight issues. James is writing post-Civil War and really never even brings up the, the Civil War in his works. And one of the main aspects that he focuses on that uh, is, is really an interesting part is that uh, many of his major characters are women. They become some of the dominant, just as you look at, at the one that you're asked to read here, uh, was uh, Daisy Miller, folks, on, um, on a young woman. And she becomes sort of the emblem, if you will, of the American spirit, but also the American girl. Um, the uh, European view of what uh, the young American woman is, Daisy Miller becomes sort of the embodiment of all that. Um, Talks a little bit about James's family, um, his uh, father uh, being a religious philosopher, his mother, um, uh, it says, a stay-at-home mom. Uh, his older brother, William, um, became a uh, psychologist, a philosopher, wrote a number of books. His works have been reappraised in a couple of uh, different in, uh, manners over the years. Uh, so much so that some um, who look at style and writing uh, techniques and, and, and that quality of writing um, hold William James to be a better writer than his brother. But during their life, uh, it was um, it was Henry James who was the dominant writer and the most critically uh, uh, well-received writer. Uh, but you see the details here. Um, eventually, what happens uh, with um, with Henry James is he leaves America, goes to um, to Europe, and eventually becomes a, a British citizen. So, yeah, he's actually cons considered American, but he's included in the um, uh, English anthology and also in the World anthology, as it says here. Um, he stayed in England, Switzerland, and France as he was growing up. He really didn't have a formal education per se. Um, uh, he, um, you know, looked at the view, as it says here, um, uh, he suffered some sort of injury at some time, um, 
and which prevented from serving in the Civil War, um, that uh, when he was 21, uh, he started reviewing works in the dominant uh, publications of that era, uh, the Atlantic, North, North uh, American Review, the Nation especially. Um, he, uh, uh, despite his lack of education, since of being formally educated, uh, went to law school briefly, uh, decided he didn't like that. Um, he, excuse me for all the little pop-ups here, we get mail messages. Um, he uh, uh, moved to England. Um, as you'll see here, he was uh, early 30s when he did so. Um, and made visits back and forth uh, to different areas, but for the most part, settled in England, eventually became an English citizen. It says here that much of his, uh, his uh, work uh, brings in uh, uh, quite a, a bit of details. It says here's his prodigious creative energy, uh, his sacred rage of his art, he was called to it. And uh, um, you have some wonderful works, uh, the novels that, that he, he wrote. Portrait of a Lady is a wonderful work, it really is. Um, um, you have some other ones, um, The Turn of the Screw, which is also in your textbook, I did not assign to you, but it's a, a gothic aspect about ghosts and all sorts of fun things, really good. Um, Golden Bowl, last major work, really for the most part. He has a number of other ones, The American, written not long after he had moved to England, um, uh, really good. Daisy Miller is written in 78, again, just a couple of years after he had moved to to England, where he's really looking at the values of the old world contrasted with the values of the new world. And as it says here, the new American girl uh, becomes a really key aspect, the role of women in the United States, um, the, the detail that, that she is and how she, uh, as it says here, resists the European social mores. And that's mores, not mores. Uh, the social moral standards, and she's not going to conform to those. Um, the contrast, uh, it says here about and American social mores, mores but uh, really what uh, Daisy Miller starts representing is that independent attitude, uh, the view uh, of, a, of a girl who is going to do what she wants, what she knows is right, what is right for her, uh, and what she also sees is better. Um, at least in her estimation. Uh, the story, of course, it focuses upon Winterborn, highly symbolic name. Uh, he is Winterborn, in the sense that he's closed off and cold. Uh, and Daisy Miller, Daisy, uh, association with spring and, and new life, comes in and the contrast is, is evident. And Winterborn, drawn toward Daisy, but unwilling to, uh, to break from the standards and the expectations of society and you have all these conflicts being de uh, developed in this one. Um, you have uh, Portrait of a Lady says a wonderful novel, Isabel Archer uh, is one that you really see this development where this is uh, built and in, in, in heightened. And again what's really interesting is many of his major characters um, in his novels uh, offer the perspective from the feminine point of view where you see women as major figures looking at society or confronting society and in conflict with those standards. Um, really good works. They really are. Uh, he writes some just some really strong novels. Uh, and this is one of them. Uh, he also wrote some uh, critical works where he talks about what works of fiction should be. The Art of Fiction is one where he discusses that. He has some really good short stories. They're really excellent. Um, I mean, they're just... He has uh, uh, some wonderful works, um, um, you know, that uh, as you go through, if you, if you want to read some more by him, uh, you'll find out that just how good he is. As it says here at the end of your little introduction, the social word he describes may seem a bit distant, but it does command attention. His ability to create a landscape of ambiguity and doubt, his insights, the moral judgments um, that are made that are maybe perhaps not so so right that we need to have. Um, and so when you look at Daisy Miller, at least I hope when you look at Daisy Miller, it's called A Study. Uh, it was published in a magazine uh, and then eventually in a book. Um, and uh, what you wind up with is this focus on, again, Switzerland, everything's set in Europe. 
we know that, as I just went over, that that's where his background was. Uh, he you know, traveled when he was younger. That He's now moved to England when he's writing this. So he looks at the world. And so, as it says here, American travelers were extremely numerous. This is at that age, this time after the Civil War, in the 70s, you start having a number of the industrial um, businesses where people are making money and are becoming wealthy, and Americans start traveling. They are going abroad for culture purposes. Um, and so this is what, what he's looking at and, and representing here. Um, and you have the details. It was a beautiful summer morning, and whatever fashion the young American looked at things, they must have seemed to him charming. And this young American is Winterborn. And we have some details. His aunt is traveling with him. He's traveling with her. Um, he was 27. Um, he was supposed to be studying. That's the idea. That he's over there traveling, but he's really not so much in pursuit of any understanding. He's just having a good time. He is Winterborn. Uh, attached to Geneva. And again, the setting is very important here. They're in Switzerland, in Geneva, and Calvinism. Um, John Calvin, um, in the 16th century, uh, had control of Geneva. It is a theocracy, if you will, where um, it's the religion that runs every aspect of, the, of society in the city. Uh, it's the government, it's the church, etc. And so you have this idea about Calvinistic view, uh, which is very strict morally. The Calvinists are the uh, individuals who, when they moved elsewhere, and when they moved into England, became known as the Puritans. And the Puritans, when they uh, moved over to the New World, they were the pilgrims. And so you have this very staunch, strict moral standards. And Winterborn is associated with this. As it says here, he had a, an attachment for the metropolis of Calvinism. Um, and so that's a key aspect that we see. Uh, as you go through the, through this, uh, you have some other details um, where, again, you have a child um, coming up, uh, and the details offered there. Um, will you give me a lump of sugar, he says, a voice immature but not young. It's a hard little voice. Um, says you may take one, the boy steps over and takes three. Um, um, and so you have suddenly this, uh, um, you know, um, you know uh, this idea of, of, of the boy taking three instead of one, of not really seeming to care about the standard, violating what Winterborn has told him. He even tells him, I don't think sugar is good for, for young boys. Um, he says, you know, uh, Deb Mary says you'll hurt your teeth. I've only got seven teeth. My mom, mother counted them last night. One came out right after. Um, it's this old Europe. It's a client that makes them come out. In America, they didn't come out. It's these hotels. Um, and so, you know, that anybody can't get any American candy. American candy's the best. And are American little boys the best little boys? I don't know. I'm an American boy. See, you're one of the best. So you have this young boy saying, are you an American man? And said, American men are the best. What you wind up with is this assertion about America and the idea about the quality uh, of life in America, that it's Europe to blame that the boys' teeth are falling out, that American candy is the best, that American boys, American men are the best. And here comes his sister. Um, and uh, that, you know, Winterborn says American girls are the best girls, you know, for keeping up this attitude, Winterborn says. She ain't, she's always blowing me, nagging at me. Um, and so here she comes, uh, the description of her, uh, and uh, that she was strikingly, admirably pretty. Um, and so she comes, the little boy is there, and Randolph, what are you doing? Uh, you know, and uh, he's an American man. Well, I guess you'd better be quiet. And so here's Daisy. And the first aspect that we see is is that she seems to be very conservative, knows description, uh, but not quite conservative. She's in white muslin. That would seem to emphasize this very conservative, very simple uh, uh, quality to her. But, but, 
There are hundreds of frills and flounces, knots of pale-colored ribbon. She's not wearing a hat, which if you're outside, you know, women are supposed to keep their heads covered. She does have a parasol, but even the parasol is more decorative than purposeful. It has a deep border of embroidery. So suddenly this white muslin that was seen to be a simplistic and very you know conservative style of clothing is changed because of the frills and the flounces and the knots. Um, and we, you, those are telling that, that although she may appear this, she's going to be something else. Uh, as you go through the novel, we have the exchange here the first time. Uh, and notice how often Winterborn, in, in thinking about Daisy, who Sammy doesn't know yet, what is the focus for him is this, pretty, how pretty they are. Uh, this idea that, again, emphasis when he looks at her, um, pretty American girl, this pretty American girl, um, constantly focuses upon her appearance. So we gain the view that Winterborn does not worry so much about the depth of quality of a character, just the appearance. And that seems to be also how he views where they travel. It's the appearance, not the reality. It's not the underlying deeper meaning to something. It's just, oh, I've gone to Italy. Oh, I've gone to Switzerland. Oh, I've gone to these different areas, and I've seen these things without really trying to explore, understand, or question. That's not what it's going to do. Um, and, you know, the details here, um, you know, um, and Randolph, of course, says he doesn't want to travel anymore. He wants to go back home. He wants to go to America where he can get American candy, where American girls are the best, uh, American men are the best, where the weather won't cause his teeth to fall out. Um, and so, again, Winterborn looks at her, and again, the focus is the beauty of the view. Um, her charming complexion, um, that she doesn't seem to be offended or fluttered by it. He just, he, she seems to accept this. Uh, again, wonderfully pretty eyes. Uh, anything prettier than his fair country woman's various features. You know, he relished the feminine beauty. Uh, he regarded her face, you know, you know, details. That's all he's looking at. Um, this idea that that it's the physical aspect. Um, he did wonder if she had a spirit of her own. Uh, he was sure that she probably did, but just looking at her face, there was just that. Uh, it creates this impression then that Winterborn um, is more caught up in surface than deeper context. Um, and so again, um, Randolph, you know, tells him that, you know, he's Randolph C. Miller. Her name is Daisy Miller, but that isn't her real name. That isn't her name on her cards. Her real name is Annie P. Miller. <coughs> and so, but she goes by Daisy. And again, as I mentioned earlier, that becomes really important as we contrast Daisy with Winterborn. Um, the idea about, um, they're from Synecdoche, upstate New York. He's in a business um, that um, doesn't like to travel. He doesn't like Europe. He wants to go back. Um, you know, that, that brother doesn't want to do this. He, he, wants, you know, he hasn't got any boys here. Um, you know, so he doesn't get to play anywhere. It's not what it is that he wants to do. Um, and so what you wind up with is um, they meet some different people uh, that Miss Featherston wanted to... Uh, you wonder why I didn't give Randolph lessons, instruction. Um, and so you, you wind up having the mother's going to give him a teacher as soon as they get to Italy. Um, he's only nine. He's going to college. And I did that different aspects here. What we wind up with seeing a contrast that Randolph is being groomed eventually, of course, to go to college. But, of course, Daisy is not. There's no reference for her. And this is part of that contrast we see. She and Winterborn talk. 
Again, what he notices most about is the charming, tranquil attitude, her physical appearance, and as she talks, um, the details that are offered. I'm going to go down here. It says Winterborn was amused, perplexed, and charmed. Uh, as she talks about details and, and aspects and uh, meeting people, uh, that he had never heard a young girl express herself in just this fashion. Just straight out, no, as you might think, no subterfuge to it. Just, um, I have more friends, more gentleman friends, and more young lady friends, too. Um, I've always had a great deal of gentleman society, she comments. Again, Winterborn, all her prettiness in her lively eyes. That's all he's noticing. Um, was she simply a pretty girl from New York State? Um, was she a designing, audacious, and scrupulous young person? He, he doesn't know. Other than she looked extremely innocent. That's all he's looking at. He's looking at the surface. Uh, as he was inclined to think she might be a flirt. A pretty flirt, but that's all I can think of. He doesn't know. He's not asking. So she was only a pretty American flirt um, that he's trying to pigeonhole her. He wants to have a way of saying this is who Daisy is. He doesn't need any other details. He thinks just that she is a pretty American flirt. There's a phrase again. And so as you go through the, this relationship that developed between Winterborn and Daisy, Daisy is willing to accept him and look at him and wants to know him. Winterborn is frequently pulling back from that, pulling back from exposing himself to her and getting to know her better. Um, and, and so you wind up with, with details uh, that, um, that you have these uh, exchanges. Um, and so you have Eugenio show up, handsome young man who's traveling with him. Um, as she says, he's the courier, of the, basically the guide that they're using to go through Europe. Um, and so uh, she looks at Winterborn, blushes a little for the first time, um, says you're staying at this hotel and you are really an American. Um, this convey that she picked up acquaintances. So you, what you wind up with is in chapter one, this detail where, as he looks after her, uh, that now, as is the tournament of the poise of a, of a princess, that she seems to be something else. But he doesn't really explore that too well. Um, when you move to the second chapter, and again, I'm going to go over here, um, you'll see there are only four parts to the novel. So it's really not that, that long of a work. You'll see it, it, it finishes in about 40 pages. It's all it really takes. Um, but part two of it, um, you have Winterborn meeting the rest of the family. Uh, you have the aunt, his aunt, Miss Costello, uh, getting to, to meet. Um, and we'll know, he comes back and asks, has she heard about them? Uh, does, does she know any of these? And so, um, you know, I'm afraid you don't approve of them. And Mrs. Costello's comments, they're very common. They're the sort of Americans that one does one duty by not not accepting, by not not accepting. Uh, this idea is that, of course, as I said earlier, that James is writing in an era. He's writing at a time when we have the rise of the industrial uh, situations in America and people are making their fortunes. Uh, you have individuals who are coming from not having much to now being wealthy, just as uh, Randolph asserts that their father is wealthy. He's rich, he says. Well, that's where they're coming from. That's why Randolph is going to go to college. Uh, the idea about getting an educated, and he's going to be changing the, the life in that way. That's why the plan is to get Daisy some culture by going over to Europe, exposing herself there, and maybe even meeting someone there. Um, you have this contrast in the views and the attitudes. Um, and so you have Miss Costello, as it says here, um, is a wealthy woman. Uh, let me go back up here where it says, a widow with fortune, a person of distinction. Which means basically she is a woman who has inherited money. Um, they are old school, if you will, um, while the, the Millers are not. Uh, as Winterborn says, she's not a Comanche savage. And again, the use here 
of the phrases shows this uh, attitude and view uh, that certain uh, uh, sections of society had that Native Americans had to be all savages. They don't qualify for anything else other than that. Um, that they are, um, you know, although they're Native Americans, well, they must be, you know, savages. If they're Comanche savages. Um, that's how Wareborn views the world. There's a distinction, just as Mrs. Costello views the world. You draw the line. They're the kind of people you accept by not accepting. Um, and that, you know, they're not their kind of people, she would say. Um, as such, you start having the conflicts established early. Winterborn looking only at the surface, caring only about how Daisy looks. Uh, not really worried so much and trying to pigeonhole her. Oh, she's just a pretty American flirt. Um, Mrs. Costello pigeonhole, holding the whole family, you know, stereotyping them, saying these are the kind of people that they are. They're common Americans. Well, unfortunately for Mrs. Costello and Mr. Winterborn and the rest, most of Europe probably looks at even Mrs. Costello as a common American. But you have this this very stereotypical labeling that is being done. And, and James is looking at and showing us how people want to judge. Uh, it's, it's a really strong aspect. Um, you know, the Eugenio, the, the courier, I think he smokes. Well, of course, that's a you know, detrimental. Um, and so you have the details here. I'm going to go down here. Um, it says... Um, uh, she's wonderfully pretty. She's very nice. And again, notice that that's how you focus. She's uncultivated, but wonderfully pretty. And that idea that appearance is important. I'm going to take her to Chateau de Chaillon. And of course, Miss Costello gets up. How long have you known her? Um, I've known her half an hour. Dear me, what a dreadful girl. As if it's the girl's fault. As if the blame is on Daisy. Um, and uh, this is when we're born. Asks, you really think that She's a sore young lady who expects a man sooner or later to carry her off. And this idea, again, loose morals. Um, remember, he's Calvinistic in his views and attitudes. And she said, I don't know. But I really think you better not meddle with little American girls that are uncultivated. Um, that these girls are uncultivated, but basically she's saying that they don't have manners. They don't have morals. They don't have the same standards that Winterborn would have because she says you're too innocent. Um, this idea that he spent too long out of the country of America, that he doesn't realize how America is changing, that American standards and their moral views are less, uh, that they have lowered over the years. Uh, and, and again, James is making a strong comment about how people view different levels of society, not only that, the changing of society. Just as what we saw with, with Huck Finn, where you see the changes occurring, where you see a, a world that uh, is moving uh, in directions. And some people try to take advantage of that, the Duke and the King, for instance. But you also have um, Huck having to make a decision, make a, a decision about what is the moral position that he knows is right. Well, this is what we're seeing here, that Winterborn and his aunt, Mrs. Costello, um, hold one view about what is right, what is the moral position that should be followed, as opposed to this upcoming upstart, uncultivated, to use Mrs. Costello's word, American. Um, and that, you know, um, as it says here, um, you know, this idea that uh, his pre cousins were tremendous flirts. He remembers that. That if, uh, that if Miss Stacy Miller exceeded the liberal license, um, anything might be expected of her. You know, this whole idea that, that she is um, a woman who, a young woman who will do anything, which this is an interesting part also. He was impatient to see her again. Um, and that. He should not appreciate her justly and should not appreciate her fully in the way she should be because instinctively he's not set up to do that. Um, so again, he goes looking for her. They meet. She seemed to be glad. Um, 
Uh, so you have down here about uh, Randolph and what he's doing, and um, um, about Mrs. Costello that um, uh, you know, appeared today as visual, was, was prolonged, so about with a young girl, about being your mother. Uh, I've been looking around for that lady you want to introduce me to, his companion. She's your aunt. Um, so that she heard all about Mrs. Costello from the chambermaid. So this is what she hears. But notice is from the chambermaid, which of course immediately is going to set up Winterborn. One does not gossip with servants. There's a distinction that has to be drawn and a line that must be maintained. Servants are servants and not should be confidants. Um, and so this, this is a key part here. Because uh, Daisy doesn't see the distinction. She talks to people. She talks with Winterborn. She talks with the chambermaid. She doesn't hesitate. She's not drawing that that line of separation in society. Um, so we start seeing it, this view again, somewhat emphasized by um, Twain, where Huck moves in and out of different levels of society. Uh, you know, just not trying to set himself above anybody else, but also not considering anybody necessarily below him. But neither does, does uh, Daisy. Um, and so it says that, here's what the chambermaid says to her. She spoke to no one. She never dined at the, what is called the table d'hôte. Uh, that means the common table where you basically sit what we would now, what you sometimes restaurants here call family style, where multiple people from different places all sit at the same table. Um, that uh, Mrs. Costello, the chambermaid, says, you know, tells us she always has a headache. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea about uh, Mrs. Costello is exclusive. And that's a key word. She's exclusive. She excludes herself from everything, but she also limits uh, interaction with others. Um, and Dave says she'd like to be that. Uh, we don't speak to everyone, or they don't speak to us. I suppose it's about the same thing. But this idea about being exclusive um, is not necessarily a choice. Uh, we don't speak to everyone, or does that, or they don't speak to us. And that's really the, the telling part that Daisy probably would be willing to speak to everyone. She talked to the chambermaid, but people don't speak to the Millers. Again, there's a line being drawn. Um, you know, um, Daisy says, I hope she didn't have a headache every day. I suppose she doesn't have one. Well, where more so? Well, she says she does. Uh, and Daisy says, her, she doesn't want to know me. Why don't you say so? You need to be afraid. I'm not afraid. Um, my dear young lady, she knows no one. It's a wretched help. And she, Daisy goes on, you need to be afraid. Why should she want to know me? And again, what we see uh, is that Daisy knows that some people don't want to accept her. But as I said earlier, Winterborn uh, is looking at her, wanting to know her, but he doesn't want to know her fully. Eventually, as you go through the other two parts of the novel, as he gets to know more about her, more about her, there are details he looks at and tries to rationalize why she's not suited, why they cannot be together. Uh, and so it's part of it. Um, and so they go on and look at um, And so as you, you go through here, this idea about, I'm afraid your mother doesn't approve of my walking with you. Um, and Daisy looks at him, because here comes your mother. Uh, it isn't for me, it's for you. That is, it's for her. You know, this idea, well, I don't know who it's for. Mother doesn't like any of my gentleman's friends. She's right down timid. The idea that uh, if I didn't introduce my gentleman friend's mother, I shouldn't think I was a natural. Um, and so here's the situation. Winterborn is going to pull back, and she tells him, well, I know why you're doing this. It's not so much for me, it's for you. Uh, that, that you don't feel that you want to be introduced, that that's making you drawn further into the circle, that you're getting to know too much. You're getting to know her mother um, and Winterborn, of course, is trying to pull back. Um, but she says, well, you know, as sister, she gave him a serious glance. She understands. Daisy sees. Uh, Winterborn is caught up in the physical, 
just looking about how pretty she is, uh, Daisy sees more fully. Um, and again, they've met for a couple of times. They've only met a couple of times. They've talked quite a bit. And it's just now that Winterborn gives her his name. Um, Daisy says, oh, I, dear, I can't say all that, which, uh, again, suppose that we have a full name, uh, probably first, middle, etc., and she just says, Mr. Winterborn. Um, and here comes um, her mother. Uh, and that's all, all she says. And so we have the description of the mother, dressed with elegance, diamonds in her ears. Again, remember what Randolph said, their father is rich. Um, um, yeah, uh, did, you know, did you get ran off to go to bed? No, couldn't induce him. He wants to talk to the waiter. He likes to talk to that waiter. Uh, again, Randolph has no distinction. He doesn't, he approached Winterborn, didn't hesitate to ask him for something. He talks with a waiter. There is no line of distinction that the Millers have. Uh, Mrs. Miller, when she's introduced to Winterborn, doesn't try to do anything, pull back, etc. She just accepts and goes on. Um, and so you have the details here and uh, the idea about uh, Randolph and, uh, and Daisy Miller. I shouldn't think you'd want to talk against your own brother. Well, it's tiresome. He's only nine. Uh, we wouldn't go to that castle. And then she pronounces, Daisy does, I'm going there with Mr. Winterborn. And Daisy's mother doesn't do anything. Winterborn feels he must explain. He must offer. Your daughter has kindly allowed me the honor of being her guide. Um, and, um, you know, the details. And Daisy, she wants to go around, but there's a lady here. I don't know her name. She says she shouldn't think we'd want to go see castles here. We should think, she should think we'd want to wait till we got to Italy. Seems as there would be so many there. Uh, we've been visit several in England. Um, and Winterborn says, yes, there's plenty in England, but Chilean is worth seeing. Uh, and so, again, it's this whole idea uh, that the views here, um, you know, and Mrs. Miller says, it seems that there was nothing she wouldn't undertake. A very telling comment. Daisy has that spirit. Remember that um, Winterborn's comment about her spirit earlier. And what we see then is, is James exploring this idea of the American spirit as embodied in Daisy Miller. Uh, don't draw distinctions. Don't try to separate society into classes. Treat all people equally. Uh, view everyone. Uh, do what one knows or feels is the right thing to do. Act in that manner. Keep yourself focused in that way. Get to know people not just on the surface level. Uh, so when Mrs. Miller makes the comment, um, he says that, you know, Winterborn thinks that she would enjoy it. You're not disposed to take it yourself going to the to the castle. Um, Mrs. Miller says, I guess she'd better go alone. Um, and so um, Daisy then, you know, asks you know, Mr. Winterborn, don't you want to take me out in the boat? Um, you know, well, Annie Miller, you know, the mother's right there. Um, but notice how, how Winterborn responds to it. Instead of saying, yes, Miss Miller, using American, he relapses into French. He uses a continental, European continental expression, mademoiselle. He does not use English to refer to her as if this is going to, you know, separate them further. And so what you wind up going about going off into it. Um, uh, and so it's a challenge he puts to Winterborn. Um, I'm sure Mr. Winterborn wants to take me. He's so awfully devoted. And he says, well, as if, you know, she's really sort of being sarcastic here that we gain, that she's challenging Winterborn to act against his nature, to row in starlight to chilling. Um and um, this, I want you to take me out in a boat. And this is, again, what Winterborn notices. 
It's impossibly prettier than that. It's that physical view. That's all he's worried about. But he's being challenged and he acts out of his normal. Um, and so they go get a boat. Um, and they're going to uh, row out. And Eugenio tells, I think you better not go out in a boat. Um, Winterborn wishes this pretty girl was not so familiar. Again, you start seeing Winterborn looking at her again. Pretty girl. Um, the relationship she has with Eugenio, their guide, her courier, a paid servant, um, and being familiar, as in just talking with him and talking, allow him to talk back to her. Um, and so, <clears throat> when they're looking at this idea, <coughs> excuse me, the view is that um, um, Winterborn does something, he acts, um, you know, he wants to do this. Um, Randolph's gone to bed. Uh, Miss Miller said they can go. And so she looks at him, good night. Hope you're disappointed or disgusted or something. He says, I am puzzled. Uh, so they don't go off in the boat. But, and she's trying to challenge him to do it. He's left there going, he's not sure what he's feeling um, and how he's feeling about this. That Daisy wants him to do something out of the normal and he actually says he will, but they don't. And so when you look at this story, as you go through the last parts of the novel, I'm trying to cover this very quickly. I want to keep this about 40 uh, minutes or so, so you don't have quite so long. And I'll do a second one looking at the second half of the novel. What we wind up seeing here is that the next day when he meets Daisy again, they, that's when they go off. Uh, then they go to chilling. Uh, then they look at it. Um, and this idea that uh, the details about um, his going back to Geneva. Uh, remember, that's the, the seat of, of, of the Calvinism. Uh, this idea about going off to, the, to those details. I'm going to go down here. There's a comment I want you to see. Uh, that Winterborn mentioned Mrs. Costello. They spent the afternoon with Miss Daly Miller. Um, the Americans of the Courier. Uh, yes, the Courier stayed at home. She went with you all alone all alone and she sniffs and says and that is a young person you want me to know and this whole idea that that his her willingness to go off with winterborn violates the moral actions that a quote-unquote virtuous young lady would follow she doesn't demonstrate that uh, but again it's the american spirit that we see we see that Mrs. Costello always calls them the Americans, the American person, the American girl. She's an American too, but as if, as if her labeling the Millers as the Americans in this way puts them into a different category, and that Daisy's actions put her in a different category. Uh, and it's going to be that, that contrast between the old world and the new world that we see with, with Daisy Miller. So I'm going to end this, uh, this commentary now. I'll do another one later for you about the second part of the novel. And we're also going to look, I'll also talk about a few of the other works uh, in a different one. Uh, so I'm going to try to get several posted for you guys to, to look at as you're hopefully working on your essay that's due in a, uh, in a week. Uh, I'll go over some other details with that also for you. So I'm going to get this finished up here, and uh, I'll get this posted as soon as I can.